Coming up on today's show, we're going to talk about insurance claims, all of the storms on the West Coast and the East Coast, and what you can do to protect yourself and get the most out of your insurance policy. Buckle up, everyone. You are strapped in and ready for the Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman, informing, educating, and entertaining Californians one policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. Hello, hello, and welcome, everyone. This is Carl Sussman, and you are tuned in to Insurance Hour. Excited to be here. Lots of stuff to talk about, but let me give you all the all the numbers first so you know how to reach me. If you have questions you would like to talk about, claim questions, storm-related questions, how-to, what-ifs, all that good stuff insurance-related, you can call right now while we are live at 559-656-0317. Otherwise, you can also send your questions to questions at insurancehour.com. We are live right now, and we are sharing our goodness of insurance knowledge with the following incredible stations. We are on KMET 1490 AM, KSTE 650 AM, KALZ 1400 AM, KZSB 1290 AM, and KFIV 1360 AM. And if that's not enough, you can also catch us on Spotify, Tune in, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music. I can't say the you-know-what word because everyone's machine will start talking. Of course, we're on YouTube and podcasts, and we are streaming live on X Spaces. Now that we have all that out of the way, let's get to it. Uh, as you probably are aware, if you are anywhere in this country, uh, you, we have been dealing with some significant weather activity, whether it be uh, storms in on the West Coast or unbelievable hail on the southeast in Florida, we are seeing just about everything. And with the with all of these claims, with all of these events, we can expect to have claims. And we're starting to get them. We're starting to hear about what's happening with people and the claims that they're starting to see. And they are having questions. So I'm going to do the best that I can to answer some of those questions for you here today preemptively, because chances are, if someone else has a question, you probably do as well. I'm going to start out really simple. And I did a few of these points recently on some local media that had me on during the storms in California. And so I thought what I would do is work backwards from there and give you some some highlights, some pointers of what to do when you're preparing for some type of weather event that's coming. Now, this is focused more along the lines of storm, water, that sort of thing. This is not necessarily hurricane, tornado, things of that nature, although these tips can also be very helpful for that. Any type of weather event, here are some things you want to keep in mind in the event that you do experience or know that you have a storm coming your way. The first thing that you need to pay attention to, and everyone laughs at this, but let me tell you, I saw it with my own two eyes, is when you are in the midst of a storm or there's a storm coming, turn off your sprinklers. I know it sounds crazy, but if you're out and about, you will see it. While the rain is pounding, while the storms are happening, people's sprinklers are still turning on. People are in their homes, right? They're, they're, they're safe in their homes. The sprinklers are on timers and the timer just turns the sprinkler on and there you go. So you've got a deluge of water and people's sprinklers going. And it's not as if those people driving around are going to stop and go knock on the door. Hey, hey, neighbor, you might want to turn your sprinklers off. So first, obviously, we don't want to waste the water. And second of all, you're just saturating your, your home and your neighborhood with more water that you're trying to, in essence, keep your, health, your home safe from. Timers on sprinklers off. Someone actually had a great suggestion. You know, we keep getting these storm alerts on our phones. We get amber alerts, storm alerts, things of that nature. I'm going to be speaking in Sacramento next month at the Capitol about some insurance related issues. And I'm going to bring up the idea that perhaps when there are storms that we're looking at, flash flood warnings, things of that nature, that in addition to having the usual flood watch in effect where you basically look at the alert and you say, okay, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do to maybe actually say a few things in there. Take shelter, turn off sprinklers, put a few things in that message. We're already getting the alert. Why don't we have a little bit of practical information that we can pass along as well? So we'll be working on that. So turn off the sprinklers. The next thing is we tend to be, how do I say this? 
connected to our mobile devices, right? We're, we're really attached to them. So if you know there's a storm coming, make sure that your cell phone is charged. And if you have any of those extra battery blocks or an extra charging case, keep those charged up and handy as well. Now, it's not just because we, we have cell phone addiction, but during storms, it's very possible that there might be a power outage. Now, if there's a power outage, most people have internet connectivity at home. That internet connectivity will go out as well. Or even if it didn't, your computers for the most part are going to be going offline or the battery will run down, something along those lines. The cell phone is running on a different infrastructure than your home internet connectivity, whether you have fiber, cable, whatever you might have. So remember, in the event of a storm, your cell phone may still work because again, it's working on a different system, on a different infrastructure. So that is your lifeline. That is your connectivity to the outside world. If your power goes out and the internet goes down in your home, that's the way for you to stay in communication with potential emergency officials. If you need help, if there are additional alerts that are coming, that will be a place for you to get them. So this is the one time you're going to be told, be sure to keep your cell phone charged handy and even an extra battery, because that might just be the way that you are able to stay in touch with people. Now, during storms, you might have something happen with the power going out, like we're talking about, and the first thing that goes through people's mind is, well, what happens to my food? What happens to the food in the fridge? So I'm gonna tell you what you might want to think about doing in the event of a power outage. This is actually good in case the power goes out for any reason, storm or not. Now, first, you want to stop the browsing, right? You don't want to just be opening the fridge, peeking, closing, and opening, closing, peeking, closing. Decide what you want. You know, know what's in the fridge. Get it, close it. Because as long as that refrigerator door stays, clo stays closed, your food and your perishables will probably stay relatively cool. Now, this is the part nobody likes. In the event of a sustained power outage, open up the freezer and take out the ice cream. Take out the frozen peas. Take out some of those things that are not essential and put those items in the refrigerator because what that will do is that will actually act to continually keep your refrigerator and your food from going bad. All right, now I know nobody likes to give up their ice cream. Some things in the freezer you can very happily take out and put in the refrigerator to keep the refrigerator cool longer and you can put them back in the freezer after the fact, right? Some things it's okay if they defrost and you refreeze them, just be careful. But the point is that you can keep your freezer items in your refrigerator because that will keep the things in the refrigerator cooler longer, okay? Another one to keep in mind during storms, remember back in driver's training, they used to teach us, if you're old enough to have, remember having driver's training, they would teach us that when you park your car on a hill, if your car is on an uphill, then you would turn your wheels to the left. So if the brakes went out, the car would fall back and the wheels would stop the car in the curb. And if you're on a downhill, you would have your wheels turned to the right. Well, what the heck does this have to do with a storm? Well, let me tell you, it only takes five, six, seven inches of water for your car to be literally lifted off and start moving along with water flow. So what you will find is you will see a lot of damage to vehicles that are literally off and running. They are literally being swept away. They're hydroplaning on storm water that's carrying them around. So if you can't have your car in the garage, that's obviously ideal or under a carport. If it's on the street, just take a few seconds to, to run out there, turn those wheels in the right direction so that in the event there is that level of moisture that's coming down and water flowing, you're not going to have your car take off. And whatever you do, and I've actually seen this as well, don't try and stop your car. First of all, don't get in front of it, please. Second of all, if even if you can catch up with the car as it's sliding around and you manage to even get in, it doesn't matter because you're not going to be able to press the brakes and stop the car. It doesn't work that way. You're going, you are effectively, the car is, it's almost like being on ice. Six, seven inches of water will move the car. So what you wanna do, maybe chase after the car yelling, get out of the way, something like that, but stay safe. And just remember that there's nothing you can do once that happens. Getting in the car, even though that's our inclination is get in the car, do something, is not really going to help. So keep in mind, this is a, this is a really good tip and you, can and you can prevent damage from happening to your car. You can prevent damage happening to other people's property, other people's cars as well. Now we're gonna take a quick break and when we come back, I wanna talk a little bit more about how to deal with the situation like having a claim and to file or not to file and questions like that. Be back with you in two seconds.
I'm sure many small business owners out there have been hearing a lot about fractional CFOs, but aren't quite sure what they are or how they can help. Let Semaphore guide you and help fulfill your fractional CFO needs at SemaphoreHQ.com. A fractional CFO is a part-time, on-demand financial expert who can help you with scaling and tracking your financials and making smart financial decisions. A fractional CFO is more than just a number cruncher. They are a strategic partner to the founder and a trusted advisor to the growing leadership team. They can help you transform your business from a one-person startup to a small, mid-sized team. So now that you have a better idea on what it is, how do you know if you need a fractional CFO? The answer depends on your stage, size, and goals. If you are interested in learning more about how a fractional CFO can help you scale your business, call or text us today at 720-766-8869 or check us out at semaphorehq.com. Hello, hello. We are back. Thank you for being with us again. I, again, am your host, Carl Sussman, and you are tuned in to Insurance Hour, where we are discussing everything insurance related. Specifically, we're talking today about things having to do with catastrophes and claims and things of that nature. Remember, you can reach me anytime for questions at 559-656-0317 or send an email to questions at insurancehour.com. Again, if you miss all of, if you have missed some of this show, you can catch it. It'll be replayed on some terrific stations as well as as a podcast and on YouTube. So don't worry if you've missed some goodness and you want to find out what you missed, you can always jump on there and get the rest of your your missing story, hopefully, from us there. Before the break, we were talking about some things to do preemptively to prepare in the event of a storm. And in some cases, what to do during the storm if there's losses. Now, one of the things that people talk about a lot is, well, what do I do after the fact? How do I know if I should be filing a claim? Now, in most markets across the country, the property insurance market is very, very tight. Or in the industry, we call it a hard market. That means that there are not a lot of options. There are carriers that are currently either not offering more additional um, policies or non-renewing policies, it's, it's difficult. And we're not going to get into today why this is happening. We've done multiple shows on that, and I'm sure we will again. Suffice it to say that right now, obtaining property insurance, depending on which state you're in, can be extremely challenging. States like California and Florida, for example, very challenging. So we've been telling people, you really just want to put in the claim if you absolutely have to, because you don't want to look, you don't want to ruffle any feathers with the insurance carriers. You want to be sure that you can keep the policy that you have since it's so difficult to obtain a new one. So how does that affect us right now during this type of a situation where there's a storm? We'll look at the California storms that we had most recently. Now, when there's a storm like that, it's what insurance carriers will call a cat event or short for catastrophe event. Now, when a catastrophe event is called, what that typically means, and this can vary by insurance company, they will not hold claims that are a result of a CAT event against policyholders, which is really good. In essence, they're saying, well, you absolutely couldn't have done anything about this, so you're not, you're not going to be penalized as having been negligent in some way and have a loss count against your, your claim record. Now, what constitutes the cat loss is not uh, by any means specific to all carriers. It's not uniform. Every insurance company has their own guidelines for what they consider a cat loss. Also, they also have their own determination as to whether they're going to charge you or not for that cat loss. So this is something that you want to chat with about your insurance. You chat with your insurance agent or broker about to find out, say, hey, if I'm on the fence about a claim, is has this carrier that I'm with deemed this a cat loss, is this something that would be chargeable against me? Very important to find out because, again, you don't want to find yourself in a situation where you can't obtain a policy because you've been non-renewed because of a claim. Now, other than that, when would we want to put a claim in? Well, in general, you want to check and be sure that you have damage that would be excess of your policy deductible. Now, I know a lot of times our think our feeling is, I've been paying insurance premium, I want to put the claim in. And it stops there and you'll just go for it. And I understand that because I have been, just like you have been. 
I also understand that when you're filing an insurance claim, you want to be sure that it's actually worthwhile to do it. Make You have to make a business case for yourself. For example, if you're filing a claim, any claim, whether it be during a catastrophe event like this or not, and you end up collecting $1,000 after your deductible, probably wasn't the best idea to file that claim. I get it. Well, then why do I have insurance? Okay. You have insurance for the large losses. That's what you need to look at your property insurance and your auto insurance for that matter in, in, in the light of. This is not something that's going to pay or you would want it to file a claim for just for some small type of damage. So the general mantra that I give people is if you can comfortably afford to pay for the damage, especially in this hard market where it's very difficult to obtain property insurance, then you probably should just deal with it out of pocket. It makes people mad. And I get it. I completely get it. But we have to deal in the reality of the situation. And due to climate change and due to these unbelievable weather events that we're having, we have to be a little bit more strategic in what we're doing when it comes to claims. Now, by all means, if it turns out that there's a significant claim and there's massive damage, I'm not saying don't file that claim. I'm saying make the determination before. Spend a little bit of time discussing it with your broker, get an idea of the level of damage, and then decide if it's going to make sense for you to file the claim or not. Because this this is when, I hate to say it, this is why you have an agent or a broker. You wanna be able to have somebody that you feel is intelligent, that you can speak with, that will give you informed advice about the industry, and what will the ramifications be in the event you do have to file a claim. Does that make sense? And I understand it's frustrating, but this is the reality we're, we're living in, and it's better to make an informed decision than just be angry, make a decision, and then have something else happen and end up having to deal with that later, which could be a non-renewal, a significant premium increase, who knows what it might be. As a reminder, questions, you can call in at 559-656-0317. I am here and ready to take those questions for you. The switchboard is open and I'm getting the thumbs up from the, 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 the man in the sky who's uh, manning those phones. So give him a call for any insurance issue you want to chat about, 559-656-0317. All right. Now, since we have an idea about claims and whether we're going to file them or not, a very general idea, Talking about storms and these catastrophe events that have recently happened, what type of damage should you be looking to see to get an idea, should this be something that I'm looking for coverage for or not? I'm gonna rattle off a handful of them and we'll talk a little bit about each one. The first one is damage caused by water. Now, when you're looking at storm damage, we know we're talking about water for the most part, right? We're talking about water entering through the roof. We're talking about water that might, you know, a window might have broken and rain driven water has been coming in. There might be flooding where there's rising water. There are different types of damage by water. Now, there are different policies that will also cover those types of losses and they are determined based on what the type of loss is. For example, if there's, a, if there's a storm and it's raining, and let's just use this as an example, and again, these are not hard fact, these are examples, and there's water that's coming in through the roof. Typically, that would be a water damage claim that would be covered on, under the average homeowner's policy. Now, if water starts to rise, it's coming under the front door and it's rising up, 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 it's starting from the ground coming up, that would typically be covered under a flood insurance policy, not a homeowner's insurance policy. Again, your mileage may vary, but we're talking in generalities. Now, mudslide and mud flow and earth slide, all these different ways people describe it, is a real big problem. We had in California from the recent storms literally hundreds of mudslides. And unfortunately, that is one of the perils that is typically not covered under a homeowner's policy or a flood insurance policy. So, of course, the begging question is, well, what policy do I get for that? I wish I had an answer for you, but the answer currently is there really isn't one. There are no policies that you can just pick up the phone and call and say, hi, I'd like to get a policy for a mudslide. It's not something that has in the past happened with the level of frequency that the insurance markets in general have crunched numbers and come up with a product and priced and sold. So if you have, or it's found when you're filing a claim that it's because of mudslide, 
typically that's not going to be something you're going to have coverage for, regardless of if you have a homeowners and a flood policy or just the homeowners policy. It's tough. It's very, very difficult. And I think depending on where you're located, the, the best thing you can do is keep your eyes and ears open to see if there are any grants that the state might be giving to try and help you with damage and costs to rebuild and things of that nature because it is, it's happening a lot more than it used to. I think in the next few years, we will probably see some form of mudslide coverage. I know there's actually a bill uh, in Washington that Adam Schiff just put forward. It would create what's called a national reinsurance product. And again, beyond the scope of today's show, we'll talk about it in a different show. That would more than likely have events like mudslide included in it. So I think, again, since climate change is, has been changing the environment so much, oh, bad, bad pun. This has been changing the types of events and weather events that we've been having. We're going to start seeing products, insurance products change along with them. And part of the slowdown is because we do have some reg some regulations in different states that make change difficult or make it happen at a slower pace than we probably would want it to have happen, right? It's That's the breaks of the game. But just be aware that mudslide is one of those nasty devils that you, it, you're really going to have a hard time getting coverage for. Now, one that we have seen a lot during storms is wind-driven rain. Well, what the heck is that? That is just what it sounds like. It's damage to your structure because of the sheer velocity and volume of the rain that's pummeling your house. Florida recently had a hailstorm. Actually, I think two or three hailstorms. I was speaking with uh, a meteorologist there. He was explaining to me how they're seeing hail the size of golf balls and softballs coming down. Wow! We're talking about massive, massive amounts of damage. Forget the property. Think about being outside. You don't want to go outside and try and move your car when there are softball-sized pieces of ice pummeling you from the sky. Let me tell you. And this is probably a good time for me to remind people. And again, I understand. You don't want to ever put yourself in harm's way to try and protect your property. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that if you have to try and clean out rain gutters, you shouldn't do it because climbing a ladder is dangerous. I'm just saying if you're going to do it, be careful, right? But always remember, property can be replaced. Property has a dollar value assigned to it. And nobody likes to have damage to their property. But I can promise you we all would much rather have that than damage to people. All right. Certain people. Okay. How about at least ourselves? Can I get that? Okay, so, so you have to remain vigilant and you have to remain safe and worry about the property next. If you have to have an order of operations, protect the people, then the property, right? And that could be property as far as a vehicle goes. It could be property as far as your um, your home, pol your, uh, your home, pol your, blah, blah, having trouble speaking, your vehicle or your home. Okay, remember you wanna take care of yourself and be safe before you worry about the tangible items, okay? Something else to keep in mind is during storms, you might see trees falling. This is a big one. And what is that? Well, again, under most homeowners policy, you will be able to find coverage in the event a tree falls. Now, forget the joke about if a tree falls in the forest, I'm not gonna go there. And I'm certainly not going to take, go back up to the extreme end of that joke. but. Trees falling, again, typically are something you would be able to have covered under your property insurance policy. What tends to get a little bit sticky is, was it my tree and it fell on a neighbor? Was it my tree and it fell on my property? Was it the neighbor's tree that fell on, the, on my property? It gets a little bit confusing, let's put it that way. So the best thing to do, again, in the type of situation is you're not an insurance expert, you're not a claims adjuster, you're not supposed to be, by the way. Don't feel like you have to have all the answers. Don't go outside with a tape measure and try and find the property line. Don't start having it out with your neighbor about wh whose tree it is and who maintained the tree and, and, and prescriptive easements and all sorts of legalities that are far beyond the scope of anything you want to be thinking about. This is why you have an insurance broker or agent and why you have an insurance company. If there's a downed tree and there's damage, go to your insurance agent, go to your insurance broker, go to the insurance company, and talk to them and find out. Sometimes what will happen is if the other, if let's just pretend that in your mind, you look at it, it's the neighbor's tree, neighbor's property fell on you, 
Clearly not your fault, right? Why would you go to your own insurance company? Well, if you're having trouble getting the neighbor to actually step up and file the claim and start to get the damage repaired, sometimes what your own insurance company will do is they will do the repair work and they will do what's called subrogate, meaning they will go back to the neighbor's insurance policy and get their money back which is great for everybody because now your insurance carrier has not been out of pocket anything, which means that that should not affect your claim record. And at the same time, you've been able to work with your own insurance company, your own claims adjusters, the people that are looking out for you rather than being what's called a third party claimant, right? You're a third party to the other insurance company. That's something you'd like to, in essence, I don't want to say avoid, but that's something that you would want to, You, it's a lot easier to work with your own insurance company than it is to work with somebody else's insurance policy, which makes sense, right? You're not their client. You're not their customer. You've not been paying them premium. You're just somebody else that's filing a claim and likely they're going to end up having to spend money and pay you in order to have that claim get settled. So keep in mind, if you're having trouble with a neighbor and their insurance policy covering something that you believe you have damage from, you can go to your own insurance company and see about having them pay for the damage for you. And then they will hopefully subrogate back to the other insurance company. All right. Having said that, let's take another quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk more about different types of damage, when to file a claim, when not to file a claim, and different things you can do in the event that you have filed a claim and how to deal with that. Back in a flash. California's insurance market can be challenging, but Sussman Insurance Agency knows the way. Trusted for two generations in home, auto, and personal insurance. Call 877-411-5200 or visit sussmaninsurance.com. Navigate with confidence. Hello, hello, Carl Sussman. Welcome back. Thanks again for being here and and learning about how to deal with your insurance policy and potentially your insurance claims after some pretty harsh weather that we've been having. Remember, if you have questions, you can call in at 559-656-0317 or send an email to questions at insurancehour.com. You can also dial pound 250 keyword insurance and that will get you to someone that can help you out right away. Before the break, we were talking about subrogation, which is an interesting tool that insurance carriers can utilize to recoup money that they've paid on your behalf. Think about it this way. If somebody, ha- if you have a car accident and the other person is clearly at fault, but they're just being slow to take responsibility, but your insurance carrier is 100% sure it's their fault, sometimes your own insurance company will pay for your damages and then go back to that other carrier and get your and get the money back that they've paid. Let's face it, you and I can push and push and push, but when it's one insurance company to another insurance company, first of all, they're much better at it than we are and let them do it. That's part that's one of the tools in their tool chest to try and uh, maintain premiums and keep you from being dinged for something that's not your fault. Okay. Something else I wanted to talk about in the in the recent storms whether you're on the west coast or the east coast, And that's what happens when a storm damages your vehicle. Now, again, if we're talking about the storms in California, a lot of people are thinking, oh, there was damage to my vehicle. What am I going to do with what's going to be covered? Now, most damage to your vehicle, if the vehicle is not in motion, right? So you're not driving it, is going to be covered under what's called comprehensive coverage, or it's also known as other than collision. I can't stand that they call it comprehensive. They've called it that forever and ever, and that's just the way it goes because comprehensive implies what? Well, look it up. Comprehensive means a lot or everything or close to it. So I think it's very misleading that we call it comprehensive coverage because it literally has one function and that's to pay for physical damage to the vehicle while the vehicle is not in motion. That's it. That's not very comprehensive. But that's the coverage line that it would be falling under in the event that you have a claim like that. So if your car does you know, have a leak in the window or you are unlucky enough to not roll the window up and, and water got into the car and damaged it. If you are one of those unlucky people and the car gets <laughs> slidden, slidden, 
slide away or it slid away and became slidden. I think I'm having a Harry Potter moment. I was going to say Slytherin next. So you're going to look to put that claim in with your insurance carrier under the comprehensive coverage line. Okay. Now they will figure out once again, whether that's something that is going to be, uh, during a cat loss, right? If it's something that happens during a storm or not. However, in some states, comprehensive losses are not chargeable regardless of why. So, for example, in California, a comprehensive loss is not a chargeable loss on your insurance record, which is pretty cool. It's just not. It's in the regs. Other states might be a little bit different. So, Remember that even though when we're talking about storms and damage to your property, your vehicle can get damaged as well. Look to your insurance policy, your auto insurance policy for that. And keep one other thing in mind. The vehicle policy is going to cover the vehicle, not necessarily the stuff inside. So again, if you happen to leave your laptop in the car and you're dry cleaning in the car, it's amazing how mysterious it is whenever there's damage to a car. Everything that the person owned in their whole world that was expensive, they just happened to have in the car. And yes, I'm being a little sarcastic. Maybe I'm a little jaded because I've, I've seen that happen so many times and you just sort of, mm-hmm, yeah. You just happened to have picked up that diamond ring and left it in the glove compartment. Oh, you were just at the ATM and took out all that cash and left it in the car. Unfortunately, sometimes we're our own worst enemies when it comes to claims. And, and then we wonder why the premiums go up for us, but you don't want to get me started. So some states will not charge for the comp claim, but things that are in the car would be covered potentially under your property insurance policy. So if you do have your laptop that was in the car and it gets damaged during a storm, your auto insurance policy would not pay for the damage to the things in the car. What would pay for that would be a property insurance policy, a homeowners or renters, a condominium owners, things like that. Keep in mind, it's, it's a little confusing because where does the car stop and the stuff inside, you know, where's that line? And sometimes it does get a little blurred with upgrades to the car and things like that. However, if you think about it like this, when you're getting your auto insurance, you have to get it priced based on the vehicle, right? And the insurance carriers know what the vehicle costs. The insurance carriers know what the vehicles are going to cost to repair. And if they can't price it, if they also assume that you're going to have $10,000 worth of equipment in it, right? So that would not be covered under the auto policy because they would have no way of pricing it or, or knowing that it's, that it's there to begin with. Keeping that in mind, loss under your property insurance policy would be under what's covered personal property away from home. And it's usually a percentage of the personal property total coverage that you have on your homeowner's insurance policy or your renter or your condominium owner's policy. So again, without a pun, your mileage may vary, but in the event you do have damage to things inside of your vehicle, remember that you can actually look to that policy, your auto insurance policy to get damage paid for, uh, to, get, to get your claim paid for, okay? Now, let's talk a little bit about what do you do once you file the claim, okay? Let's say you've gone through all the, the, the machinations mentally, you've done the math and you realize that yeah, this is just a significant enough claim. I need to file this claim. I need to, I need some assistance with this. So how do you do it? Now, there are multiple ways to file a claim. The most, well, I shouldn't say the most. Let's just take three, for example. You can call, you can file it online, maybe on your computer, or if your insurance carrier has an app. And let's talk a little bit about all three of those ways because there's benefits and challenges to each of them. Before I do, remember you, if you have questions, you can reach out at 559-656-0317 or send your questions to questions at insurancehour.com. Okay, if you're filing your claim on the computer, that's fine. Re make sure that you put the basic information in answer all the questions, and be sure you get a claim number or some type of confirmation number at the end. Sometimes people think they've answered all the questions and they go along their merry way, and it turns out they actually haven't. And then there's a problem because now all of a sudden the claim hasn't been opened and you're waiting, 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 you're getting annoyed and, and the insurance carriers know the wiser. So you have to go ahead and be sure you get some type of a confirmation number. Same thing goes if you're putting in the claim on your insurance company's app. Now, those tend to be a little bit easier because they ask less questions and it's really just an initial reporting stage. It's just quickly to get the claim information submitted. It's just get that out there for people and get the claim process started. Again, 
Be sure you get a confirmation number. Just take a print screen, uh, screenshot, whatever you want to do. Make sure you have proof of that claim number or that confirmation number, or as one of my clients called it, the receipt. Get a receipt, which is exactly right. Get proof that you purchased or proof that you filed that claim. Now, calling in and reporting a claim is another way to do it. And the, I, I don't have a problem with it, but I will tell you that it does tend to take a little bit longer, and I'll tell you why. The insurance industry is a little bit like your doctor's office. You know, you go to the doctor and you sit down with someone and they say, so what's wrong? And you say, oh, it hurts when I do this. And they say, well, how long? Is, well, I don't know, for a month. And they go through all these questions, they're taking notes, and then they leave. And then they come back and there's a, someone else that's, either the doctor or another nurse, they're taking your vitals and they're asking you the same questions. And you're like, okay, I just went over this, but you go over it again. And then finally the doctor comes in and guess what? The doctor is asking you the same questions. When you call to file an insurance claim, the system is a little antiquated sometimes. And I, again, I'm speaking in general terms, different insurance carriers work in a different way differently. But what you'll find is you'll get an initial claim taker, which is really just going to say, what happened? And when did it happen? They're not going to tell you, oh, you have coverage for that, or oh, you don't have coverage for that. They're simply going to say, thank you for that information, and what do you have to get? A claim number or a confirmation number. Sometimes they'll also give you your claims adjuster's information, which is a great thing to do. If you can get a hold of your claims adjuster's information right there and right at the, on the spot, then you're even better off because you know the next step. You know who you're going to be communicating with. All three methods require getting confirmation that you filed the claim. But understand that when you're calling, you will get a claims taker. They may, in fact, transfer you to someone else to get more detailed information. You see the doctor's office example. And then guess what? The claims adjuster, I can almost guarantee you, regardless of which way you filed the claim, is going to start out by saying, what happened? It's, it's frustrating. And they're not trying to do it in a way to be to catch you. I've had people say, well, I'm afraid I'll say the wrong thing. First of all, if you tell the truth, you never say the wrong thing because the truth is the truth. It's always the same. It doesn't change. So a lot of times the process might seem like they're trying to trick you or catch you in some inconsistency. It really isn't. It's really just a process. And the process, sometimes it does go through different people. And let's face it, if I was a claims adjuster, and wow, they have my respect because I could never do that. Can you imagine? All you do is deal with people after they've had something bad happen. My hat goes off to the claims adjusters that are out there. If I were a claims adjuster, I tell you, I wouldn't want to look at someone else's notes and start dealing with a claim. The first thing I would want to do when I talk to a person is say, tell me what happened even though I know they've probably already told the story at least two other times. It's just one of those things you wanna do. So remember, you wanna get a confirmation number, no matter how you file the claim, and regardless of anything, if you do get the adjuster's information, it's always nice to send them a quick note. I like to do it some, I, I wouldn't be pushy, I wouldn't be, okay, you're my adjuster, where's my money? Yes, I've seen emails that are just about that, that uh, aggressive, you wanted to just maybe reach out and say, hey, here I am, you're my adjuster, here's my claim number, you know, please contact me at your convenience. Remember, and, and we could do an entire show on the claims adjusting process, maybe have an, a claims adjuster come on and we can do some Q&A with them. It's a challenging, challenging job. And speaking of challenging, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that when we come back quick break and I will answer some more questions. I had a couple come in over email while I've been talking. I'm going to look at those, get those ready and answer those. Remember, you can reach out at 559-656-0317. Back in a flash. In a tough California insurance market, you need expert guidance. Trust Sussman Insurance Agency with a legacy of understanding complex coverage needs. Call 877-411-5200 or visit sussmaninsurance.com. Treating clients like family for two generations.
Hello, hello, and welcome back to our final segment of Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much again for being here. Hopefully I'm helping you with this. I know that it's been tough uh, to try and deal with insurance carriers and to deal with premium changes and claims potentially. So keep in mind that I am here. Use me as a resource. I want to help in any way that I can. You can reach out anytime during the show. When it's uh, live, you can reach out at 559-656-0317. Even if you call that number, you can call it anytime. We have a voicemail set up. You can leave your question and I am happy to answer it either directly. I can answer it on the air. I can play your recording if you like or not. Just let me know in the message. Or if you want to email me a question, go ahead. Questions at insurancehour.com. Once again, I want to thank all of the awesome stations out there that are broadcasting all this great information. We're talking about KMET, KSTE, KALZ, KZSB, and KFIV. You guys are rock stars. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Now, I had some emails come in while we were talking earlier, and I have always hated that expression. We have not been talking. I have been talking. Nobody else has called in yet today. So while I've been here yapping, we did get a few emails that came in. And interestingly enough, uh, we covered some of the topics, but somebody emailed in asking about food spoilage and if that's going to be covered. We talked a little bit about that earlier, about what to do if your power goes out and what's going to happen in the event that you do lose your food, right? It means food costs money. And if you've got a refrigerator full, some people have two refrigerators and a freezer. If the power is out long enough, it's entirely possible that you might end up in a position where that food is spoiled. So here is the general answer for that. Because again, all policies are a little bit different. They're not commodities. It's not a boilerplate. Everything is the same. In general, food spoilage is something that is covered under a property insurance policy with a few caveats. First, there's a limit. Right. So if you claim to have you know, 40 bottles of fancy you know, liqueur or wine or champagne or now you see how unclassy I am. You wouldn't put that in the fridge. Oh, well, if, if, if there are limits to it. OK, it's not an unlimited amount, first of all. And second of all, it's going to have it's going to be also determined on what caused the power outage. OK, if the power company just screws up and the power goes out, that's not typically going to be something you would have coverage for because that's sort of an odd one, right? How could you, how would you be able to price for the potential of the property insurance, the property insurance, the uh, water property? (sighs) How can you price and how could an insurance carrier know what to do in the event that there's a power outage? They can't price for that because they can't predict it. You would have to be able to have a claim occur that then triggered the power outage that then caused the food spoilage. Okay, it's called proximate cause. It's a legal term. Again, we don't want to get into that. Not an attorney, not giving legal advice, that's for sure. So if there's a storm and a power outage, then you could see, well, my fridge has been out. I have food spoilage. And it could, you could see yourself having coverage, but not just in general, right? Only in the event that there's a covered loss that started this chain reaction of power outage, food spoilage. Does that make sense? That was the first question that came in from earlier today. The The next question came in asked about claims adjusters, and uh, I won't use the language, but they were asking how to deal with claims adjusters. And it's interesting because, again, I was just talking about this before the break. Claims adjusters have a really tough time. I mean, again, it is a thankless job where you are literally dealing with, with people when they've all had a loss, literally. Every single time they get a person to talk to, that person is going to be not at their best because something bad happened. They've had a loss. So I always try and remind people that, first of all, claims adjusters are people too, okay? And yes, you want to be pissed off because of what happened, because the guy rear-ended you or because your roof leaked and all these bad things happened. That's fine. You can do that. But let's also keep in mind the claims adjuster didn't do it. They weren't at your house hacking on the roof to make their make sure there'd be a leak the next time it rained. They weren't in the car with you when you had the car accident. They're just doing their job. And I hate that expression because it has bad implications. But it's really, in this case, it's, it's literally true. Their job is to look at the insurance policy and look at what happened to you and pay you appropriately based on the policy. That's it. It's not personal. That's, that is their job. So in, to answer the question from this email that came in, how do you deal with an insurance adjuster? I would say like you would deal with any other person you interact with in your life. You'd be decent. 
You'd be a decent person. And you understand that we're all, we're all in this together, right? Everyone's connected somehow. We're all dealing with this crazy world as it is. And you might be in the position right now of having a claim and they're in the position of being the one that's going to decide how much money you get or don't get, what type of documentation you need. All of that's going to be determined, but everyone is just trying to get through the day. So try not to take your frustration out on the claims adjuster because I can tell you for sure, I have a family member, actually two, two family members that were in claims for 20 some odd years the stories are horrific. The abuse that claims adjusters get is pretty, pretty nasty. And I understand again why, right? This is an emotional issue. This is a time when there's been a loss. Something bad has happened, almost by definition. So deal with a claims adjuster like you would deal with any other human being. Remember, they're human beings. And do what you can to be, I don't want to say even a little nicer than normal. I would be. Because they're going to be getting a lot of jerks. They just will. That goes with the territory. Any claims adjusters out there, if you want to talk, let me know. I'd love to have you on. In general, just be nice. That's really what it comes down to. You know, the golden rule, do on to others as they, you would have them do on to you. Same thing. And keep in mind their perspective, which is that they're looking at everything as... I hate to say it, they're looking at you coming in with a claim and they're saying, okay, someone else had a problem that I have to solve. That really is what claims adjusters do, right? They solve problems. They're the ones that are there in the event that you have a loss. They have to solve the problem of how do they hopefully get you back to be whole, whole once again and do it within the confines of your insurance policy. It's tricky. It's tricky. And as an insurance broker, I can tell you that sometimes we get involved and not because the insurance, the insurance adjuster is doing anything wrong. It's usually because our clients are being jerks. No offense to our clients, but it happens. And, and again, I, I understand why. And I don't mean it's like a broken record, but sometimes a little bit of kindness goes a long, long way. So that's going to be my long answer to a simple question. How do you deal with a claims adjuster is be kind. Be, treat them like you would want to be treated. Another thing to keep in mind when you're dealing with claims is you want to document everything. In the event of a loss, document things. And by document, I mean grab that phone, take pictures, take video, get as much information as you can. And this is important because this is going to help the insurance adjuster settle your claim. What you don't want to do is say, well, it started here and then it kind of ended up leaking over there and then it pooled over there, but then the carpet got wet. Just take pictures. I actually say just use video because pictures, you might get the wrong angle. You might miss something that's just a, just turn on the video set part of your camera and walk around and just take as much video as you can. For people in Florida that had the hailstorm, the advice I gave during that segment that I did was, you know what? Take some video right after the hailstorm so you can see your vehicle with all of its dents and the hail is still on the ground. Just make it easy. Do you have to prove to the insurance company that a hailstorm happened? Sometimes, maybe. My guess is it depends on what level of storm activity there was that caused the hail. Was it just a you know, quick and you know, five second event in a very small part of town? And a claims adjuster there might need to have some verification that it wasn't somebody just taking a golf club to your car, right? Always err on the side of caution and document as much as you can because you can't over document, right? And if you're afraid that you might show something you shouldn't, again, just be honest. If you're honest and you're open, then there's no problem. Take as much documentation as you can, take videos before, during, after, whatever you can. Back in the day, we used to give out the, the little throwaway cameras to our clients to keep in their glove compartment because if there was a car accident, they would have it and they could take pictures of the damage because again, let's see it right then and there. So there's never a dispute later about, well, that damage wasn't there before or that damage wasn't caused by that car. Now we all carry a phone around with a camera. So again, if you were in a car accident, man, you better get that camera out First, be sure you're okay. That's always the most important thing, right? The soft, mushy things inside the car, more important than the car, remember that? Take out that camera, turn on the video, and just walk around the car, walk to around the other car, just once, just get it done. As long as it's safe, right? Make sure you pull off the road. I feel like I should always be saying these things, you know, always be safe, but take as much in documented information as you can. 
and continue that process through the claims time. When you're exchanging emails with the claims adjuster, keep the emails. If they're asking you for documentation or receipts, keep a copy of what you've provided. And not for any nefarious reason other than you want to keep a complete file just like the insurance adjuster is keeping a complete file as well. Sometimes, again, they're human, they might lose something, they might misplace something. One claims adjuster might go on maternity and another claims adjuster comes in and takes over and they don't have all of the paperwork. Well, if you have everything nice and organized in your file, you can very easily say, here you go. And do you think that's going to make the adjuster's day? Yeah, you're gonna make their day by not having them have to go through the entire process again. If you could say, oh, don't worry about it. If you didn't get everything from the old adjuster, I've got everything right here. Always a good thing to stay, to, keep, to document things as they're happening and at the same time, hang on to the documentation after that. Does that make sense? So as we're, as we're looking to wrap up right now, I wanna let everyone know a couple of things to keep in mind. Insurance fundamentally is going to be changing. It just is. What used to be the weather patterns of the past are the past. They are not indicative of what we're seeing in the future. So our insurance policies are going to change. How they're paid, how they're priced, who the backing of those insurance carriers are, which are called reinsurers, things outside of the scope right now, okay? Auto insurance is going to change. Vehicles cost more money. It costs more to repair a vehicle. It costs more to, for someone to have to rent a car. All of these things are costing more because of the technology that's involved Expect there to be changes in premium and in product. And also, it's more important than ever to read your policy, understand it, ask your broker or agent to help you out. You're not supposed to be an expert, but you can ask all the questions you want, right? That's why they all get the big bucks. Understand that the way things were in the past are not going to be the way they are in the future. The fundamental concept of insurance is changing. Your products, your pricing, your underwriting. And with that, I will thank you again and then look forward to you joining us once again next time on Insurance Hour. I am Carl Sussman. Thanks again. I do want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen today. I know insurance is not necessarily the most sexy concept. It's not the most exciting thing in the world. It is important that you understand what it is you're getting, what you should be looking for, red flags, you name it. You just need to know more than you used to. Things are more complicated than they used to be. If you have any questions, please reach out to me directly. You can email your questions to questions at insurancehour.com or call and leave a voicemail at 559 559- 656-0317. Educating and entertaining Californians one insurance policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. This show is dedicated to Shamrock Papa.